The Gospel of Jesus Christ, Salvation from Hell and the Way to Heaven, by John Boroff. Dedicated to the glory of God, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ our Lord, in memory of Leonard Ravenhill and his impassioned and holy sermons which greatly impacted my life. Regarding Christ's lordship, Leonard never gave an uncertain sound. He held to the biblical position of lordship salvation all his life. Christ is not a savior only, but lord of all. To Ravenhill, the idea that a sinner can accept Jesus as savior while rejecting his lordship is foreign to the Bible and classifies as a false gospel. Mac Tomlinson, In Light of Eternity, page 355. Introduction. The Decline of Evangelistic Preaching. The body of Christ is living in a time right now when theology is not taken seriously. I do not mean that seminary students and Bible colleges don't take theology seriously, but on a popular level, Christians don't seem to care at all about sound doctrine, and so many of them are tossed about by every wind of doctrine. 2 Timothy 4.3, Ephesians 4.14. But more important than a need for a popular interest in theology is one in soteriology, which is that subcategory of theology which deals with the doctrines of salvation or the gospel of Jesus Christ, the message of repentance from sin, justification by faith alone, the born-again experience, and the Christian life, the only message that can save men from an eternity in hell. Long gone are the days when the common stock of Christian bookshops would carry titles like Joseph Elaine's An Alarm to the Unconverted or Richard Baxter's A Call to the Unconverted. Far gone are the times when Puritans were popularly considered heroes of the faith, when towering revivalists like Jonathan Edwards could melt a crowd to fearful repentance by preaching sinners in the hands of an angry God, or John Wesley could be found open-air preaching on the Lord our righteousness, to crowds of people weeping over sin and falling to the ground in a spirit of contrition. If it happened in the 17th and 18th centuries, why can't it happen today? Are we ashamed of the true gospel of lordship salvation, that repentance from sin and obedience to God's commandments are just as necessary to salvation as faith in the cross is? What happened to all that? What happened to valuing Martin Luther's commentary on Romans as the ultimate Protestant re revelation? An enemy entered into the vineyard of the Lord and sowed tares among the wheat, Matthew 13, 25, and the tares were heretics. In the 18th century, universalists and antinomians began to sprout up, not for the first time in church history, but for the first time since many of the reformations had been laid down by the first of the Protestant reformers. Universalists and antinomians are still with us today, although they might be completely unfamiliar with the terms universalist and antinomian. What's more, these heretics are usually high-profile Christian church leaders. Universalists distorted the doctrine of hell by saying that scripture declares salvation for all men, even the devil, that hell is only a temporary place of purification for the wicked, not a place of eternal punishment and fire. Their hell resembles something more like purgatory instead of anything Jesus taught. Some universalists deny the existence of hell. This was a rehashing of the heresies of origin, which were condemned by the Fifth Ecumenical Council. The practical result? A non-judgmental tolerance of non-Christians in their unconverted state, without seeing the need to preach repentance, faith in the cross, forgiveness of sins, and salvation to them. Antinomians distorted the doctrine of God's law by saying that faith alone in the death of Christ on the cross, without good works, is all that is necessary for the Christian life, and ultimately for salvation from hell. Failing to distinguish the moral law from the ceremonial law in Scripture, they took New Testament abolitions of the ceremonial law to also account against the moral. Far be it from them to admit that faith without works is dead, James 2.17, they chose to settle for a dead faith which produces no good works at all, and so brought damnation on themselves by living unspiritual, carnal lifestyles. By persisting in lawlessness and sin, they came to interpret Christianity as nothing but a religion of cheap grace, mercy, and God's love, and shunned the serious realities of law, justice, keeping God's commandments, repentance, righteousness, holiness, the day of judgment, 
in hell. The practical result, abusing the grace of God and living hypocritical, unethical Christian lives. Evangelical Christianity went through a phase in the late 1800s and early 1900s when it came under severe attack by liberal theologians. This was called the downgrade controversy of modernism, and Charles Spurgeon was the primary target of those who were doing this attacking. Spurgeon was the, like the Billy Graham of the time. He was an international evangelical figure and to this day is considered the last of the Puritans. Another Charles in England at the time, Charles Darwin, had just published On the Origin of Species, which claimed to be a scientific argument for a naturalistic origin of the world without the creation miracles described in Genesis 1-2. to Many of the pastors and priests of the time were becoming persuaded by Darwin and losing their faith in biblical creation, and hence the rest of scripture. The German higher critics, who were also atheistic, poked at the Bible, claiming it was full of contradictions and could no longer be trusted. R. A. Torrey and various other evangelical theologians rallied together and published a series of booklets called The Fundamentals, which would become the foundational writings of the fundamentalist movement and the standard reformed and conservative evangelical response to these and many other modernist liberal theology heresies. It seems that during this theological firestorm, the gospel of Jesus Christ got lost in the details. Unlike the days of the Puritans and the Great Awakening preachers, when all theological energy was concentrated on conversion, soteriology, salvation, and evangelism, now it seems evangelicals became preoccupied with defending the Bible, proving that evolution is wrong, refuting strange cults, expository teaching on various themes or chapters in scripture, etc. Evangelicals did not lose their vision of the cross of Christ or the need for salvation from hell, but many of the precise Puritan doctrines of salvation were lost from the pulpit. Repentance, penal substitutionary atonement, justification, regeneration, sanctification, etc. It really was a break with the Reformed tradition. Practical ethics remained a concern for some, and it still is today a tension between fundamentalist and evangelical Christians about how to relate to certain things in culture, for example, TV, music, alcohol, to be in the world but not of it, also with political views, usually conservative. Yet for all of this, where is the gospel? Christianity is surely more than a religion of personal opinions about ethics, isn't it? As evangelicals entered the 1960s and 70s, the Jesus movement brought a new generation of young people, hippies and non-hippies, into the Christian life, largely through college campuses. There were a lot of contemporary innovations, such as Christian rock and other things. Campus Crusade for Christ's Four Spiritual Laws tract that came out in 1965 became the basic message of salvation for this new generation of evangelicals. It taught... 1. God loves you and offers a wonderful plan for your life. 2. But man is separated from God by sin. 3. So Jesus alone died on the cross for your sins so you could know God's love and plan. 4. But we can only know God's love and plan by personally receiving Jesus as Savior and Lord. I want to humbly and respectfully suggest, with all due respect to those involved with Campus Crusade for Christ, also known as CRU, that while there is saving gospel truth in this message, I think it has some important differences with how the message of salvation was understood and preached during the Great Awakening, which appears to me more driving, straightforward, and clear. That repentance, faith, justification, and regeneration are the only way to escape from eternal damnation in hell. And it will be my attempt to communicate this message throughout this book. In the 1980s and 1990s, the seeker-sensitive movement sought to be more welcoming of non-Christians, spiritual seekers, and agnostics and skeptics into the church. It seems it's a mixture of the Jesus movement, the entertainment industry, and the concept of friendship evangelism. The idea that being accepting, tolerant, and non-judgmental towards non-Christians is the most effective way to really win them over by love and influence them to become Christians. It has proven to be very effective at attracting large numbers of people to church services, 
mega churches, but I think it is about as far from the kingdom of God as one side of the Grand Canyon is from the other. There are very few sermons on repentance from sin, faith in the blood of Christ, the forgiveness of sins, and obedience to God's word in such churches. Sermons are all tailored so as not to offend those who are visiting. Some of these churches are removing crosses from their churches because this, this t statistics show people find the cross to be an offensive symbol of death. The words of the Apostle Paul are still considered the offense of the cross, Galatians 5.11. The prophetic movement grew out of the charismatic renewal and the Jesus movement in the 1970s. Its leaders are men like Bill Johnson of Bethel Church, Rick Joyner of Morningstar Ministries, James Gall, and many others. It can be difficult to judge this movement because not every leader agrees about doctrines or ethics. But generally speaking, it is a very subjective movement which seeks an apostolic renewal of the miraculous gifts in 1 Corinthians 12-14. I believe most of this movement is racked with carnality, simony, vanity, false prophecies, and presumption. It greatly lacks spiritual discernment, and that is because as a product of its generation, it lacks the reformed Puritan gospel. Tossed about in a subjective sea of dreams and visions and voices, it seems charismatic Christians have no objective gospel heroes or gospel standards to look to for their discernment and discretion. While several of them will claim not to believe in experience that contradicts the Bible, we can't say this principle is applied across the whole movement, nor that it is applied through any objective traditional lens of interpretation, like creeds, for example, the 39 Articles or the Westminster Confession, but rather through their own subjective interpretations of Scripture and experiences of spiritual dreams. I believe the new Calvinism movement going on right now is a good thing. Although I am thoroughly an Arminian and a cautious charismatic, I appreciate, I appreciate a lot of the theology taught by Reformed preachers that I can't find elsewhere. Lordship salvation is our common ground. The works of John Bunyan, Jonathan Edwards, George Whitfield, and Charles Spurgeon have much to offer the church for sound teaching on hell, the atonement, salvation, and the Christian life. I tend to agree on finer points of doctrine, however, with Arminians like John Wesley, Adam Clark, John Goodwin, Richard Baxter, and James Arminius. I can only loosely call myself a Wesleyan or Holiness or Reformed Arminian because I have to reach over to Edwards, Bunyan, and Whitfield for my doctrine of hell, the atonement, etc. Plus, I agree with Puritans and Reformed Christians on progressive sanctification. I do not agree with the Wesleyan doctrine of entire sanctification or, or Christian perfection. If I were to put myself into a certain theological camp, my views of salvation would probably align closest with the Free Will Baptist Church. In Chapter 5, I do take a stand for conditional security, or the view that a born-again Christian can lose his salvation, which will, without a doubt, make some of my Reformed brothers feel uneasy. Although I do not believe preaching conditional security is essential for evangelism, I try to make a case for the doctrine from Scripture, reason, experience, and historical church leaders like Irenaeus, Luther, and Wesley, all of whom believed a born-again Christian could lose his salvation through unbelief or falling into a sinful lifestyle. I originally started to work on this book as a manual for street preachers. Seeing the need for a preached theology for open-air preachers, I thought to try and perfect my own preaching by studying the works of other great open-air preachers, mainly John Wesley, in secondary sources about his theology. Kenneth J. Collins, Thomas C. Oden, Harold Lindstrom, Steve Harper, etc. Living Waters, the ministry of Ray Comfort, and the documentary Go Stand Speak shows us that my generation is starting to see the rise of a new breed of open-air preachers or street evangelists who want to bring a reformed gospel to the public arena and be used as instruments for modern reformation and revival. We've been smitten with an old-time gospel message and want to heed that admonition to go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. John Boreth, Durham, North Carolina, May 27, 2013.